Yeah, tonight I'm going to be walking us through uh, building your own in-house code bin uh, with some very dirty tricks. Uh, so I'm going to, I shouldn't be too ashamed, but we'll see where we get. So yeah, uh, I'm Jay. I work at Stripe. I work on the uh, dashboard platform team. Uh, I'll get to exactly what that is, but I can basically be summed up by I ride my bike a lot and I eat a lot of burritos and that's pretty much the ins and out of me. What's up? Oh, closer. How's this? Great. Thumbs up in the back, thank you. All right, cool, so like I said, I uh, work on the dashboard platform team. Uh, we own lots of fun things, like the asset pipeline, um, internationalization, all of the tooling around that. We own our data fetching layer, which is currently a homegrown solution. Uh, wouldn't say we're thrilled with it, so we're looking at GraphQL. Um, we own all of the front end docs, we own our front end component library, um, and we own like all the in infrastructure around sharing those docs and building new components. Uh, so just to give us a quick walkthrough, uh, this is what our component library looks like at Stripe, and this is uh, our main portal uh, for discovery. So we have simple components for, this is just a general container on rendering a content area. That's like, this is what happens when you have no content, this is what happens when you have some content, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is our code puncher for when you hit 2FA. So all of these um, really vary in uh, their level of complexity. Uh, so we call this collection of components SAIL. It's an acronym that I don't totally remember what it stands for, uh, but that's what we call it. Uh, so here's basically what most of the code looks like. We, we are a React shop, uh, so everything's, everything in here is a React component. Uh, let me get back. So we try to make it platform agnostic. Like We don't care what your data fetching layer is. Basically, if you use React, you can use our components. Uh, but also you have to work at Stripe because this is internal only. Uh, I don't think we're gonna expose it anytime soon. But basically we tried to make these dumb components. So we have a whole world of uh, implementation creep in uh, Dashboard, which is our main experience, where you run into stuff like how we handle dates, like we use Moment, how we handle internationalization. So all these are deep uh, dependencies that uh, the components at the Dashboard layer would be unusable if you were to try to extract them and start using them in, their, in your own uh, project unless you had our exact uh, build pipeline. But at the sale level, we're inoculated from all that. Like a button is just a button and anyone can use it. Um, because while at Stripe, the main product that we have is our dashboard, but we also have uh, smaller projects like our admin tools that someone in ops would use. Like uh, someone hacked my account and is <coughs> emptying out all of my money. Like admin would be the tool that you go into to use the UI to lock down that account and uh, reset the user's password. So sale components are reusable everywhere. Uh, and honestly, our sale components are built more by design than you would think. Our designers are wildly talented. Uh, they're significantly better at CSS than I am and they can write some JavaScript. So they're kind of in, uh, in this portal working with sale tools day in, day out. Okay, so I just wanna touch a moment on the fact that we use Flow. Um, I'm just kind of building a story here to get to why we built an internal code pen. But we use Flow at Stripe and it's a bit of a love hate relationship. Can I see a show of hands for anyone else that uses Flow or has used Flow? All right, not too many people, so you'll just have to take my word for it that while type checking is like a very good thing, like when you're working with a function and you're shuffling data around, like if you start treating something like a string that's not a string, Flow basically tells you like, hey, knock it off, that's not a string. So you don't have to actually run your code to, to get these unwelcome surprises. Uh, the problem is uh, Flow is written in OCaml, which is not the most approachable language. Um, we have a couple masochists at Stripe that actually really enjoy OCaml and find it challenging to go look through the source code whenever there are bugs with Flow. Uh, and Flow's gotten great, but it's taken a while to get there. There used to be many bugs with Flow where you would get a Flow error and ultimately you would find out that like, no, Flow's just broken and your code actually is right, which is a bit disheartening. Um, but anyway, Flow is still a source of pain. There's, there's a bit of a high learning curve, um, especially when you get into more advanced things, like you're creating more advanced objects where properties can or cannot exist. Uh, things get very complicated very quickly. So on my team, we spend a lot of time helping other product developers troubleshoot Flow, and we've found TriFlow to be an in invaluable tool for that. So let me just bring it up real quick. So what TriFlow does is, oh, why do you want to go through Slack? Don't do that. 
Oh dear. Come on. That's fine. You know, I'll get a little insight into what life at Stripe is like. So here's our flow help channel, uh, which on some days is chattier than others. But basically, someone's like, oh, my flow stuff doesn't work, and they paste this giant URL. Right? So what this does is it brings us to uh, a flow site where someone's gone in and written all of these types. So this was actually someone posting a solution, so it actually has no errors. But basically, when someone's stuck, they try to write a little snippet of the error they're running into. Uh, they post it here, and we all bang our heads against the wall seeing if we can fix it for them. There's also some nice debugging tools, like you actually get the abstract, abstract syntax tree of what's going on. So where I'm going with that is that it got us to thinking. Like, if we have this great tool uh, for Flow that lets people instantly send us links of their current state and where they're stuck, can we build something like this for the UI of people that are trying to use our internal components and they think they found a bug or something just isn't formatting the way they want? Um, so, like, how do we do that? And this is very important at Stripe because while the majority of us are in SF, we do have a number of remote employees and we do use Slack very heavily, almost to our detriment. Uh, when Slack goes down, it's a very bad time at Stripe. Uh, and also sometimes, like, trying to, you know, like the three blind men explaining an ele uh, elephant, that's kind of what it's like trying to explain a front-end problem before someone can even see it. Um, and it's a bit hard to share what your current state is or also trying to, to prototype. We don't have uh, an easy way of sandboxing at Stripe. Like, if you want to create a new page and explain to someone what you're doing, you can find an existing page and just start hacking elements in, or you can add like a dummy route to our main list of, of React router route configs and try to do that. But it's a bit painful. Sometimes you just want to get up and, and running and just kind of mock something out quickly just to get a feel of what it's gonna what it's gonna look like or how much work's gonna be involved. So we decided like let's build an internal code pen, uh, but for sale. And we'll call it Sale Pen, which was just supposed to be a temporary name, but you guys know how these things go. Uh, as soon as you write some code, now it's just the permanent name, which is a shame. We had some great uh, alternatives. One of our designers wanted to call it Dry Dock, sticking with the whole sail boat mentality, and he's still a little upset with me that I didn't change the name to it. But anyway, so let's go through the requirements. So we just want to have like a live editor with some basic niceties like line numbers, uh, syntax highlighting stuff like that. We want a live preview window that we're just going to show along the side so that we can immediately keep uh, reevaluating our code as we're running it to see updates and see what's working and what's not. We want to just make all the internal sale components available, which are, again, are just our dumb components. We have a larger universe of dashboard components that, you know, start like data fetching from our backend and stuff like that. But just to get going, we're just going to use our dumb components. And we want these sale pens to be shareable. We want to be able to just send links to other people and they can immediately boot it up in their browser and see what's going on and maybe improve upon it and send it back to us. So like any easy project, there are always restrictions that make things less easy than they normally would be. Uh, Stripe is not a node shop. So setting up any kind of fancy node service where we just kind of punt all the code over, evaluate it on the server and kick it back, which I would love to do, is off the table. So we're just going to run this whole thing in the client in one shot. It's going to be a good time. Uh, so sale, like I said, is not available publicly. But also, we just recently got our internal NPM up working properly. Sort of. It's kind of gone down a couple times. Um, but that's not in the cards either. We can't like just pull from NPM to do this either. So the way we currently use sale is it's just symlinked. Uh, it used to just be symlinked by hand into various projects and also other projects that didn't have tons of front-end devs would literally just copy-paste it into their directory, but we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we're a little bit more slick with it now. We're using Yarn Workspaces, which, is anyone familiar with Yarn Workspaces or has heard of like Lerna? Anyone? Show of hands? All right, I'll explain that too. Uh, so there's some like fancy ways of working in mono repos now. So Stripe is a giant mono repo, and other people were doing what we do. We we're just symlinking all of these other directories over that are kind of like unofficial shareable libs. And what Lerna and Yarn Workspaces let you do is you can, you set up in your package.json a basic config that says these are the directories that are actually libraries in my mono repo. And then Lerna immediately starts treating them like actual modules. So when I say npm install sale, uh, it looks to like Yarn actually looks for the directory that sale is in and then kind of treats it as an npm module. It does like a fake install where it's just kind of simulating it behind the scenes. And if I fall behind in versions, it'll actually just clone that out of uh, Git and start treating it like a node module. So it's really slick. Uh, so we can have some kind of backend, but unfortunately, it's going to be in Ruby. And at the time, I didn't know how to write Ruby, so I was just trying to avoid that at all costs. 
And finally, um, we have to not upset security too much. So like we said uh, at the beginning of this, Stripe is a company that handles people's money. And because of that, we have a very uh, well-staffed security team that is always making sure that unknowing front-end devs like myself don't do something very, very dangerous that puts the company at risk, which I did anyway. And we'll get to that later. <laughs> so the editor is the easy part, right? Like, if anyone's used CodeMirror, or if anyone's ever looking to just build a, an in-browser editor, just use CodeMirror. It's great. Uh, it has great styles. The API makes sense. Um, we actually use it in some of our other in-house products. Stripe has a product called Sigma, which lets you do like, uh, it lets you query kind of like a faux data warehouse. Uh, and so design had already taken a pass, and we already had like a CodeMirror CSS style sheet ready to go. On brand, looks beautiful. I didn't have to do anything. So kind of the fun part now. So now the, the actual preview, the way that we're going to take all of this code that we're writing in our in our in-house code pen and getting it to evaluate on the fly. So the first problem is that, so this is what a snippet of code that someone would put in this browser looks like. So problem number one, this is all ES6 code. Uh, we can't just dump this into Chrome as is and expect it to run. It's just not going to happen. Um, but lucky for us, very usable, solvable, easily solvable problem. So we can just uh, install a version of Babel uh, called Babel Standalone. You can't just use the normal Babel that you would use in your asset pipeline. Like Standalone is just fully built, ready to go, and you can actually run it in the client. Um, so code is representing everything that was in that previous pane. And we can literally just run babel.transform on it. We jam in all of the plugins that we want. These are all presets. I uh, literally just copied this from our existing asset pipeline. So now it understands React, it understands all of the new fun bits uh, in ES6. Uh, we just put in stage three because other devs just wanted some more bleeding edge stuff. And I mean, this is in production code, so I don't care. I'll let them do whatever they want. And the flow preset really just strips out flow annotations. So the second problem, and this is the really fun one, uh, which is that we've got all these uh, imports of sale components, right? And these don't mean anything either. Uh, and we have to figure out a way to take these statements and actually turn them into making these sale components available in our live editor code. Uh, so this is when we're going to get down and dirty uh, with some Webpack. So this is where webpack.context comes into play. And it's very fortunate that the talk before me um, went over all the ins and outs of Webpack as I really glossed over it in my slides. And I didn't realize that until before coming up here. So as we talked about, like Webpack's this great way of taking all of your assets, kind of glomming them together, uh, deduping them, and like finding all the dependencies and getting ready to go. So the nice thing is we're we're building our whole faux copen with Webpack. So in the runtime, we have access to Webpack and all of its helpers. And one of those helpers is Webpack.context, and it's documented, but it's still kind of it's like poorly documented, which like I feel like is developer ease for like uh, use this at your own risk, but be careful. Um, so using that web, sorry, web.context, we can literally just require in a directory, and Webpack will literally build us a context and allow us to reach all of those files. So now we're going to go to like a pseudo live demo. It's not a total live demo because I'm not a masochist. Come on. Ah. There we go. All right, cool. Uh, I'm going to try to code and periodically hold this mic, and we'll see how that goes. All right. Cool. So here's like the actual code that's running the preview window. So what we've got here, this is like, this is the magical line. Like uh, this was like a magic trick. This would be the prestige. Am I in the way? Sure. We good now? Good enough. All right, cool. So this is the magical line, this, this require.context. And this only works because we're actually in a Webpack environment, and this code is being transpiled by Webpack. So what I'm doing here is the first line is just the directory. Like I said, uh, sale is just kind of symlinked in here. So I'm literally just giving it a relative directory of like, this is where my entire component library lives. Uh, true, I honestly don't even remember what true means. Let's just say something important. Uh, the last one is, I hope you're really good at regex because you get one shot to tell Webpack what you do and don't want to include. So we've got like some mocks for our testing that Webpack explodes when it sees. We've got like a weird test util that we wrote some weird stuff in, and we also don't want to pull in CSS. We just care about JX. So here I'm just telling it like, pull in everything except for these three things. Um, and now this.webpack context effectively contains a reference to all of the components that we could possibly need. 
Uh, and I'm going to hack in some code real quick so that we can poke at it in the actual utility. Uh. All right, cool. So we just hung that on window so that I can come in here and kind of bearing the lead here, but voila, here's the tool. Uh, Okay, let's just load it up, and then, sorry, I'm gonna increase the size here real quick. That big enough? Can everyone sort of see down there? Sorry, it's kind of buried. Let me see if I can bring up the window a little bit for us. All right. Okay, so here's the, the context object that I hung on window previously. So as you can see, it just takes one param, the actual request. Uh, there are some very lightly documented uh, functions on this. So I can call dot keys. And as you can see, it just dumped out everything. So I, I've included all the sale components and this is, these are all of the keys that are available if I wanna require something. So this is just dumping out the location of, of all of the, the sale components uh, that I've pulled into this context. And then what we can start to do is, so if I actually feed it something that it's aware of, so it's aware of this, this relative component called dot button. So if I actually feed it the content, you can see now it's actually pulled in the index of uh, the button library. And then if I actually do, if I actually pull in the button, so this is actually a transpiled React component. This is the button, so I've, I've got it. I've, I've got the, the component. So I just need to figure out a way to to turn this import button into a function that'll actually return uh, the button react component that I've just kind of found through that context. So the next dirty thing that I do is uh, I call a new function here and this may look nice, but this is just kind of a fancy way of saying, I'm just gonna eval some code. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a function uh, I'm holding three dummy parameters because I'm going to start feeding in React and React DOM because that's like non-negligible. I'm going to need that to, to run this code. And then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm building my own require function. Uh, and it's great that he went over that in the previous talk. So like I said, require doesn't mean anything, especially requiring, like as you saw the, the syntax here, requiring sale.button really doesn't mean anything because um, that sale prefix is actually like a Webpack alias. So in Webpack, you can just say like, when I say this one word, it really means something else. So like if I wanted to, I, you can say stuff like when I say foo sale, that really just means sale. So in this case, like sale is actually an alias for the actual directory that all the components live in. So what I need to do is take this sale slash button and just turn it into that like dot slash button that we saw before. So what I'm doing is there's just this quick regex where I'm just taking sale, I'm stripping it off, I'm putting the, the dot lead in there so it matches up with the locations in the, the context that I just built. And then also what I'm doing is that I'm taking the ultimate value and then like dumping it into that context that I just built. So now I've just kind of programmatically recreated um, turning that sale slash button into the dot button which then gives me my actual react button. So now when someone's uh, running those imports, they're all replaced with actual require functions, and now that button actually represents the actual React button I want it to. And we're good, we're good from here. Um, the only other kind of shenanigans going on, uh, come back. Is that um, there's some acknowledgement of the fact that we're in this weird sandbox so I don't know if you saw it down here. Oh, not there. We can get rid of you. One second. <laughs> sure. Okay, so down at the bottom, it's like a little hacky. Uh, V2 of this, I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of this line down here. There's kind of an invisible component in the left-hand pane called uh, sandbox. So at the end, we just have a React DOM dot render to just take all of uh, our the React component that we built called app and just kind of rendering it against that sandbox. But we're good to go now. Like we have a live editor where we can start pulling in all of the components in our component library, configuring them, 
adding in more code, and then just kind of running it on the fly. So every time we hit run, and I'm going to have to size this back down so you guys can actually see the preview pane. Where can I drag it? Oh, sweet. Sorry, we have an intern, and he's been adding features. So I know, <laughs> even though this is like my code, I don't, I don't quite know how it works anymore. I know how most of it works, but he's, been, he's smart, and he's been doing some things, and this is one of them. Uh, so great, that works. Uh, so yeah, we're good. Like we, we've got some live code now. Um, what, I, what I excel at in programming, I lack in imagination. So the best I was able to come up with uh, for this example was just a stupid button that said happy sailing. Uh, but we're good to go. Like we can just kind of hit this and <laughs> that's not the best, but it just live updates. And every time it live updates, and I'm running this on my local so it doesn't happen right now, but we're just saving it to a Mongo backend and it's just spitting new identifiers at us so we can continually update um, and kind of like time walk back and forth and then share these results with other, with, uh, other developers. So that's kind of the magic of it all. So I had it working. It was all really great. I had it working just like Flow where it actually um, took the whole code, ran LZ string against it to turn it into a hash and then jammed it in the URL. And I was like, great, so proud of myself, gonna ship this, but let me just put it into a security review real quick. And they were not happy with me at all. Um, so also this used to run on the stripe.com domain as well, because that's where our portal used to sit. So then I learned what like an attack vector is. And <laughs> what I'd created is a entrance to, for someone to send URLs uh, to Stripe employees to evaluate arbitrary code on the stripe.com domain. Uh, that's, that's not a good thing. <laughs> so there were some security remediations I had to work through. First order of business was getting it off the stripe.com domain. Uh, if you work at a lot of big companies, like I used to work at Uber before Stripe, and there's like Uber and then uberinternal.com, and uberinternal.com has, like you have the 2FA to get in and you're much more protected. Stripe has something similar. So first was getting all this code onto that. Uh, they really didn't like uh, the hashing in the URL because anyone can send an arbitrary email to Stripe uh, if they know that hash and get, the, get us to start running code. So that had to go too. So now it just stores to an internal uh, database and we use identifiers to retrieve the code from that database because security can audit that database and the only ones that can troll you are other Stripe workers and there are many ways to do that uh, with your dev box and other fun things now. Uh, and people do do it. There are a couple of sale pens out there that will just uh, continually open kitto, kitten photos on your laptop until you force close your browser. So that's a thing. Uh, yeah, and I did have to learn how to write Ruby. So basically I threw together the whole UI in SailPen in like a week or two and then it took me like three or four weeks to deal with all the security remediations. Um, but yeah, so it's up and it's running. Uh, and there were some real unexpected um, results of this. Like we really thought uh, well, we just kind of hacked it out. And we're like, maybe people like it, maybe we won't, but we kind of built it, and it, at the least, it'll be a tool for us and other developers. But our most popular consumer of this are our designers. Like, they love it. Um, I cannot stress this enough. Like, I just kind of punted this into the wild and then went back to doing other work, and then just a whole sea, like a backlog of suggestions from our designers came in. Because they've been using it to demo to each other, to demo to product owners, to demo to uh, Patrick and John. Uh, to show them ideas that they're thinking about. So we've almost got like a Slack channel that's kind of like best of sale pen. So whereas I was only able to come up with like a card element and a button with some text and an icon, like they've been building entire pages in sale pen. So this is one, uh, someone was just, a designer was mocking out kind of some potential calls to action. Uh, where's my favorite? This one's my favorite. So someone basically built like an entire demo just using sale pen. Uh, working the whole code through. And they're just kind of demoing some uh, new, how can I put this, like a new UI language and ways to describe some of our upcoming components. So this has been wildly successful. So, oops, so much so that uh, some of my friends that work at other shops have started ripping me off, uh, with various degrees of success. Uh, SF in the Bay Area is a very small community. We're all developers and we all work at different shops. And I have a buddy who works at Instagram Web and he basically built this internally. So now they're using it as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that was kind of the idea behind throwing together this talk. If anyone else has like works at a shop that has internal libraries like this, or is just thinking of building a sandbox, like it's really that, not that hard to do once you kind of figure out what's going on with Webpack and some ways to hack around with it. Uh, it's actually super fun. And it's even easier if, you're, if the code you're working with is actually publicly uh, published and on NPM, 
there's a tool called Runkit or some other ones out there that are, you have a whole universe of public libraries available and you can just import and eval them on the fly. But since this is internal, we just kind of like did some hijinks to get it going. So yeah, like I said, um, this thing has been unexpectedly popular. Uh, designs had more than a couple of ideas of what they would like. Um, so as you saw, it was just resizable pane, allowing new pens. We're kind of, we're kind of just slowly ripping off all of the features from actual code pen to where you can take a pen, fork it as a starting point, and then start making other pens and feed them into your collection so you can have your own best of. Um, we're, we're toying with the idea of how to actually take this a step further and allow it to actually fetch against the Stripe API. So this was kind of an initiative at Stripe a while back that kind of unfortunately went to the graveyard, but we wanted to provide a mechanism for people to start writing full-blown apps against our payment API within stripe.com to help them get up and running quicker. Um, so we're starting to tool with that, but it introduces a, a heavy level of complexity. So for right now, we have, a, we have several data mockers uh, just that are mainly used to write internal unit tests, but we've started using those to actually make more fleshed out uh, pens. Because if you're making a sale pen of like a data grid and a grid of payments, you don't want to start constructing what those payments look like by hand. So we have a number of utilities where you just say like, give me 10 payments and it just randomly creates 10 payment API objects for you to ingest into your UI. Uh, and then also, coding in sale pen is a little clumsy. You're kind of working without a net. Like you're just typing, uh, like code, there's no autocomplete or flow checking. You type a bunch of code, you hit run, and then you find out you have a syntax error. So we're thinking about slowly introducing that. Flow is extremely slick in this regard. It'll give you start and end cursors of exactly where the error is and what it is. So we can easily integrate that into Code Mirror. Cool, so that's basically it. Um, I'm gonna have to clean these slides up a little bit because there are some Stripe internal links on them, but I will send them out to the Meetup group as soon as I'm able to do that. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions?